edition of Patchcast. Uh, we are sorry for a little delay because of the technical glitch. Sorry about that. Uh, today is September 5, 2023. I am Rifat Manan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Yasmin Butt, who is Assistant Professor of Pathology and a consultant in the Department of Pathology at Mayo Clinic, Arizona. And today she is going to present a very important topic that we always struggle with. And the title of her talk is Mesothelioma Updates and Challenges. As always, please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and Dr. Butt will answer them towards the end of the session. And thank you, Dr. Butt, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to talk to you about mesotheliomas, um, some updates to epithelioid mesotheliomas, as well as some of the challenges that we face. So here are the learning objectives. Uh, my goal is for you to become familiar with the types of mesos and comfortable with diagnosing them and to learn about some of the common mimics of mesotheliomas. And also we're gonna go over the grading for epithelioid mesotheliomas according to current uh, updated criteria that is now reflected in the 2021 uh, WHO. Dr. Butt, do you mind uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, removing your video if you don't mind? Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank All right, you. better? Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay. So I know this is a, a challenging topic that can cause a lot of stress, um, especially because oftentimes these cases ends up ends up going to the courtroom uh, as lawsuits are often involved. So really my overarching goal here, my overarching learning objective is to remove some of the fear associated with these diagnoses and give you a little bit more confidence uh, in making them. So first I want to start with a case. All right, so the first case here, uh, we have a 75-year-old man. He had a recurrent right-sided pleural effusion and chest pain. So cytology specimens from a tap showed uh, benign appearing mesothelial cells, nothing that looked overtly concerning, overtly malignant. However, he'd had recurrent effusions over a three-month period. And so eventually they decided to do a pleural biopsy to see if there was anything uh, else underlying. So here's a picture of that pleural biopsy. So hopefully you can see the mouse here. Um, and so this is a little strip of pleura. It's kind of wrapped around itself. You can see a little bit of cautery artifact in your bottom left, and you can see what look like mesothelial cells uh, here. Okay. All right. And here's another piece from that same biopsy. All right. So I'm not going to go into too much detail in, in this particular case, but I just want you to take a look at it and think about it. If this came across your desk, what would you do? Would you stain it? If you do it, what would you stain it with? Uh, would you be concerned about a malignancy, a mesothelioma, another malignancy? Is this benign reactive? How would you how would you um, approach this case? So kind of be thinking about that in the back of your head and then maybe modulate that based off of what we talk about. And then we'll come back to the case uh, later in the lecture. So. That's our question. You know, do we do stains? And if so, what do we do? What's our differential? And then what is the question? So we'll return later, as I mentioned. Okay, so let's do a brief overview, or not so brief overview of mesothelioma types. So right now, as per uh, the 2021 WHO, we have three types. So we have epithelioid, sarcomatoid, and that includes desmoplastic and transitional, if you've heard, those, uh, heard that terminology, and then biphasic, which is essentially a combination of epithelioid and sarcomatoid. Okay, so first thing I wanna talk about is what is the question, all right? And this dictates how you work up a case of a pleural biopsy. So if you have a case where it's clearly a malignant lesion, so no question in your mind, this is a malignancy, and then you're concerned about, well, is it a mesothelioma? Is it a carcinoma? Is it a sarcoma? Is it is some other weird thing. Um, or you have a lesion, maybe like the one we just looked at, where you're not sure. It could be a malignancy or it could be reactive, all right? So then your question is, are these reactive mesothelial cells or is it a mesothelioma? So this may seem like a simple concept, but I think it's really important to keep in mind because it will alter how you approach these cases. Okay, so let's start with question one. In question one, this is clearly a malignant lesion, all right? You have no, no concern, right? So here's an example uh, of some clearly malignant lesions. So with that, 
then your question typically uh, boils down to mesothelioma versus carcinoma. Now, of course, you can have other lesions like uh, lymphomas, uh, sarcomas, uh, but I'm not going to go down uh, that route. And certainly clinical history would play uh, into that if you're worried about metastases and, and uh, different tumors along those lines. So if your mesothelioma versus carcinoma, which is your most common differential, it really becomes an immunohistochemistry game. Okay. And so then you've decided, okay, this is definitely malignant. All right. If you look at the, the two tumors here, they're tumefactive, they're hypercellular, like there's no question these are not reactive cells, right? Anyone looking at these would say, yeah, that's a, that's a tumor of some kind. So now you know you're going to have to do IHC. So then to decide which IHC to do, you have to decide, is it epithelioid? Or is it sarcomatoid? So are the cells, you know, rounded and, and uh, more epithelioid looking, or are they spindled and sarcomatoid? All right. So here's an example of an epithelioid mesothelioma. So you have rounded cells. Um, you may or may not have prominent nucleoli. Okay. And they're forming a tumefactive process. So you're not worried about a reactive process. It definitely looks like a tumor. Okay. So if we have an epithelioid mesothelioma, like this case here, this is the staining protocol um, that I uh, personally use. So right now, uh, the recommendations or requirements are that you have two of each category. So you have your mesothelial markers and you have your epithelial markers. So I like to use calretinin, D240, WT1, and CK56 as my mesothelial markers. Um, common epithelial markers include TTF1, since you're usually in the lung. Occasionally, you know, I'm not going to talk about um, peritoneal mesotheliomas, but typically you're in the lung. So you think about TTF1. I really like Claudin 4. It's a very sensitive and a specific epithelial marker. It's a little bit newer. Um, if you have access to this, highly recommend it. Or you can go down the Mach 31 or Berry P4 route or polyclonal CEA. Mach 31 and Berry P4 basically stain the same thing. So I would if you're going to use one of those stains, I would use one, not both. Uh, just a little repetitive to use both. Um, polyclonal CEA, it's been around certainly a long time, can be a little more, a uh, little bit dirty of a stain, little, a little less specific. So I tend not to use it, but certainly will work. Okay, and a point I want to want to bring up here is that these markers on the left side, the mesothelial markers, they tell you that you're looking at mesothelial cells. They don't tell you that you're looking at a mesothelioma. So really keep that in mind. And that brings us back to that original question, are we looking at something malignant or are we looking at something that could be potentially reactive? So if we're already at malignant and it stains like mesothelial cells, then we can say mesothelioma. But if our consideration are our consideration is for a reactive process, then just because they stain with these mesothelial markers doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mesothelioma. So something to keep in mind. All right. So what about pancaritin, A1, A3? So pancaritin won't differentiate between carcinoma and mesothelioma. Both will stain strong positive for them. And I often do a pancaritin on these stains um, because it's actually really useful to assess for architecture and invasion. Okay, And it can also help you differentiate from, say, a reactive fibroblastic proliferation um, in many cases. Okay, so for epithelioid mesotheliomas, we now have a grading system. So at its basis, uh, uh, at the base, it's a low grade versus a high grade. So there's no intermediate grade. So that's probably a good thing since I think we all have a tendency to throw things into intermediate grade when we have the option, but this is just low grade versus high grade. They also recommend that you support favorable and unfavorable architectural patterns, cytologic features, and stromal features. So we'll go over all of these uh, in a minute. There's a large chart in the WHO. I recommend if you uh, see a lot of mesotheliomas, it's certainly worth uh, taking a look. So this is a lot on one page, but I thought it would be a good reference to have this all right here. So again, this is just for epithelioid. There's no grading system currently for sarcomatoid or biphasic. So what we'll do is you'll look at the nuclear atypia score, the mitotic count, and then you add those numbers to get a nuclear grade. And then you look to see if there's any tumor necrosis. So your nuclear atypia score, and I'll show you some examples of all of these in a minute. The nuclear atypia score is a simple one, two, three, mild, moderate, severe. The mitotic count is again, one, two, three for the score. If it's low, it's gonna be less than or equal to one mitotic figure uh, per two millimeter squared, which is usually about seven or eight high power fields on most um, uh, uh, newer microscopes. Intermediate, two to four, and then high five plus. In my experience, it's actually pretty rare to find a high mitotic count in epithelioid mesotheliomas. It does happen, but uh, tends not to be as common. So then you add up your score there and you get a sum and you come up with a nuclear grade one, two, or three. And then you look to see if you have necrosis present or absent. So low grade is a nuclear grade one or two without necrosis. 
All right. Nuclear grade one with necrosis also qualifies as a low grade, uh, but this is extremely rare. Uh, this is not explicitly stated in the guidelines, um, but I did have a uh, email conversation with some of the folks who were involved in creating the guidelines, and this is what I was told. So I'm passing that along as a, a little pearl there. If you do occasionally have a nuclear grade one with necrosis, it's still considered low grade. All right, and then high grade is if you have a nuclear grade two with necrosis or a nuclear grade three with or without necrosis, okay? So the presence of tumor, tumor necrosis is quite important in this grading system. And you are, um, uh, you are supposed to grade regardless if it's a small biopsy or large uh, resection type case. Okay, so these are the patterns and features that I was talking about, and I apologize for anyone who has red-green colorblindness, um, but I have uh, some uh, here in green, but I, I tried to use little asterisks as well for, for those of us that have trouble with color. Um, but uh, so green is favorable and red is considered unfavorable. So we're supposed to, support, uh, we're supposed to report architectural patterns, cytologic features, as well as stromal features. So the architectural patterns that are considered to be favorable include tubular papillary, trabecular, and adenomatoid. So tubular papillary and trabecular, quite common. Adenomatoid is quite rare. Uh, solid, unfortunately fairly common. Um, that's considered unfavorable, but you need to see more than 50% um, in order to be considered a true unfavorable prognostic feature. And then of course, micropapillary is unfavorable. It seems to be wherever you find it. And then the cytologic features um, that you're supposed to look for are rhabdoid, uh, which is uh, unfavorable, no surprise there. Other unfavorable uh, features include pleomorphic and having a high nuclear grade. And then sort of middle of the road, not favorable or unfavorable are decidioid, small cell, clear cell, and signet ring. All of these are rare. Um, so those of you that remember uh, may recall in the last edition of the WHO, these are all basically subtypes of epithelioid mesotheliomas, and now they're just considered cytologic features, which I think actually makes things a little bit clearer and a little more organized. Uh, lympho, uh, lymphohistiocytoid is also considered favorable, but again, exceedingly rare. You're unlikely to ever see this. Um, and then the stromal features, it's just one stromal feature is if you see myxoid stroma in the background, it has to be more than 50% of a tumor that has less than 50% of solid architecture to be considered a favorable feature. But I do mention it if I see it. And I wanted to make a comment about the pleomorphic cytologic features of epithelioid mesotheliomas. So these tend to act more like sarcomatoid or biphasic, but the genetic studies didn't uh, support reclassifying it outside of epithelioid. So definitely, though, if you see pleomorphic cytologic features, please, please, please mention them because that's a sign that the patient, that this patient's tumor is likely going to behave more like a sarcomatoid or biphasic. Um, I think we should have moved it based off of prognosis, but I wasn't in the room for that one. All right, so let's go over a couple of um, histology examples now that we've stared at text for too long. So this is a tubulopapillary pattern of mesothelioma, pretty standard, one of the more common ones that you see. So you can see little, little tubules. Um, you can see uh, almost these little sort of abortive gland-like structures and then little papillary fronds everywhere. So tubulopapillary pattern is considered a, a favorable prognosis and is quite common in uh, mesotheliomas. And again, the architectural complexity that you're seeing here tells you that this is going to be a malignant and not a reactive process. You, shouldn't, you should not see this level of architectural complexity in a reactive um, process. So something I always like to point out as you go on, because if, as you see, the nuclear features are pretty bland, right? These are pretty small. So you can imagine if you saw these in a, uh, in, in a tap, in a cytology specimen, they're not going to look overtly malignant, right? They're going to look actually pretty bland and, and pretty inconspicuous, which is why these patients often don't get their diagnosis until they make it to a pleural biopsy when you can truly appreciate this architectural complexity. All right, so here's another example, a uh, trabecular pattern. So here you kind of have these cords of cells, sort of anastomosing, and they look a little disorganized, you know, coming down and forming this little tumor nodule, all right? So again, architectural complexity equals malignancy. You can even see some entrapped fat here. Uh, invasion into fat also equals malignancy. All right, so this is the, the so-called trabecular pattern. Again, associated with a better prognosis. Um, remember, epithelioid has a better prognosis than sarcomatoid, and then trabecular and tubular papillary have the better prognoses of the architectural patterns. All right, so here is adenomatoid pattern, almost looks like an adenomatoid tumor. Um, and these are incredibly rare and I think quite challenging to diagnose since you wouldn't, if, if I gave this to you or gave this to myself without any context, 
my first thought would not be a mesothelioma, but of course these cells would stain like mesothelial cells and you could get to adenomatoid architecture. It's considered favorable, but again, exceedingly rare. You are highly unlikely to actually run into this uh, out, out, in, out in the world. All right, so here's a solid pattern. Uh, this has a poor prognosis and it just looks like a pearly differentiated malignancy forming solid pattern of cells. There's nothing really overtly unique um, about this. This could honestly be almost any tumor, uh, but again, location uh, will help you and then staining patterns will help you. Okay, so here's micropapillary pattern. Again, you can see uh, this is a piece of pleura and you're seeing these little single cells uh, forming these, these little florets, almost like little flower-like and single cells. So micropapillary pattern in the mesothelioma looks just like micropapillary pattern in any other tumor. All right, and this is associated again with a poorer prognosis of the epithelioid mesotheliomas. Okay, so here are some of the cytologic features. So this is rhabdoid cytologic feature and uh, unsurprisingly associated with the poorer prognosis. You can see a little eccentric uh, nucleus and more uh, deeply eosinophilic cytoplasm. Okay, so rhabdoid features there. Looks like rhabdoid features in anything else. All right, and here is a decidioid. So it almost looks like decidua from the GYN tract. Again, this cytologic feature is quite unusual and very rare. Uh, it does it does show up occasionally, but but quite rare. Uh, even I think in our in our consult service, we see this once every couple of years, maybe. All right, so here are small cell cytologic features. It looks just like a small cell carcinoma, uh, but stains like a mesothelioma. Uh, these are also exceedingly rare. I've only seen a, a small number of these cases. Okay, so here's an example of a lymphohistiocytoid. So, you know, you have this uh, uh, histiocytic look here of these uh, mesothelial cells and then lots and lots of lymphocytes around them. Again, kind of a unique looking. It may make you think about another tumor, um, but again, exceedingly unusual to find uh, this type. But it does remind us that mesothelioma can, in fact, look like anything. Okay, so here are the pleomorphic cytologic features. All right, so quite ugly, large cells. Uh, you can see everywhere. Um, and to remember that the pleomorphic, if you see this, especially as a dominant component in an epithelioid meso, the prognosis for that patient is more likely to go down the route of a sarcomatoid or a biphasic mesothelioma rather than an epithelioid. So definitely don't, um, don't miss this and, and be sure to put it in your reports. Okay, so here's an example of that myxoid stroma. Um, so you can see that sort of loose uh, bluish material in the background is our myxoid stroma with these percolating, uh, pretty bland looking, I would say, grade one nuclear features um, around with some chronic inflammation. Um, and remember the myxoid stroma, I'll mention it if you see it, but it's only considered a favorable prognostic feature if you have more than 50% of the tumor with the myxoid stroma in a tumor that has less than 50% of uh, solid uh, subtype. Okay, so let's quickly review those nuclear atypia patterns. I'll show you a couple of examples. So here's a patient that had a trabecular pattern, so cords of cells of these little mesothelial, uh, these mesothelial cells. They're fairly small, um, inconspicuous nucleoli. Um, so this would be a nuclear atypia, a score of one. All right. Here's another example of an adenomatoid pattern. Again, this is a little bit of a rare pattern, but again, this is another example of what that score one looks. Very small, very inconspicuous nucleoli. If they have them at all, you have to go on high power to really appreciate them. Um, you noticed all these epithelioid mesos with the exception of the pleomorphic uh, cytologic features, tend to be fairly monomorphic, fairly uh, the same. You don't see a lot of pleomorphism uh, in them, which is quite characteristic of epithelioid mesotheliomas. Okay, um, here's a nuclear atypia score two. So this has a kind of a combination of solid and trabecular. The cells are looking a little bit larger. The nucleoli are a little bit more conspicuous. So this is sort of an intermediate uh, nuclear atypia score. And here's a nuclear atypia score three. So this is a solid pattern. The cells are larger. Even on this lower power, you can make out their nucleoli. I hope that's coming across uh, okay on, on Facebook and, and YouTube and wherever people are watching. Um, but you can see the nucleoli a bit easier and also solid pattern. And as an aside, you can see that there is a tumor necrosis as well. So already we know just from a brief look, um, even without doing our, doing our little uh, scorecard, uh, that this is going to be a high-grade epithelioid mesothelioma. Okay, here's another example, a little bit higher power picture showing you um, the larger cells, a little bit more atypia, uh, and you can see there's tumor necrosis right here in the center. All right, so solid pattern, nuclear atypia three, tumor necrosis, this would be a high grade. Okay, so here's a sample sign out note. So for my top line for these cases, uh, diffuse malignant mesothelioma, epithelioid type, 
this particular example is low grade. So I put all of that in the top line, uh, what type it is, and then whether it's low grade or high grade. And then in the comment, you can mention the architecture um, and any uh, if there's mixoid stroma. So for this particular case, um, this was a solid a solid architecture, which is considered unfavorable, but it still was less than 50%. So it was still low grade based off of the other features. So this is a lot of text, um, but I just wanted to put this up for reference. Uh, this is something that I still have been putting in my reports, but I think we're a little far away from 2021 WHO, so I might start um, moving these out of my reports. But essentially, it explains the grading system. So if anyone is wondering, you know, what's low grade, what's high grade, what does that mean? How did we get to it? That's what this says. So I basically describe uh, what I showed you on the other page, and then I just fill in the scores and then say what the grade is. So this is more for reference for anything else. Okay, so let's go back to that first case. All right, so we have some mesothelial cells. Okay, a little bit thickened pleura. All right, and you can see here, it looks like, well, maybe this should look a little familiar since I showed it to you. All right, so what's our question here? Do we think this is definitively malignant or do we think this is uh, reactive versus malignant? All right, so what do we think? So is this a reactive mesothelial cells versus a malignant mesothelioma, right? So the right side of our chart. So it's not. And the question here is what feature here proves malignancy? Why am I not worried about a reactive mesothelial cell population? All right. And then what stains might be useful? Okay. So, so here, so when we're looking at this, you have these cells, okay. And you're like, okay, they're kind of bland. This would be, you know, if this was a mesothelioma, you have cytologic, low, low cytologic nuclear atypia. This would be one. But then when you look over here, and I didn't point this out as much the first time, but you start to see cells coming down into this connective tissue, and they're starting to look a little disorganized. So stains that might be helpful here include a pan-keratin or pretty much any of your mesothelial markers, right? I want to highlight those cells, and I want to see, are those mesothelial cells? And in fact, they are. So this is a calretinin stain, but a pan-keratin or any of the other uh, mesothelial uh, markers would have worked for this. But you can see that these cells, while they look very innocuous in much of this, just lining the surface, here they're dipping down into the fat. And when you get invasion into adipose tissue, that tells you that what you're looking at is a mesothelioma hard stop, okay? All right, and so we know that this is not a reactive mesothelial population. It's definitely malignant. And so, be, and the reason we know it's malignant is because we have invasion into fat. So what stains do we want to do? Well, we want to confirm mesothelial origin. So for that particular case, I would have done a TTF1, a Claudin-4, a Calretinin, D240, CK56, you know, those stains that I showed you from that first um, page on IHC. And epithelioid mesotheliomas tend to behave in the sense that they stain like mesothelial cells. It's very rare to find an epithelioid mesothelioma that doesn't stain like regular mesothelial cells. So typically, if you have that nice rounded look to the cells and they're epithelioid, you're going to have a good staining for the IHC in the sense that they will stain with calretinin, D240, WT1, CK56 without issue. So BAP1 and MTAP um, are supportive in a case like this if lost, but not necessary. Um, and in this particular case, I wouldn't consider them needed. All right. So a really important pitfall to keep in mind is what we call fake fat. So you know how I mentioned if you have invasion into fat, it's a mesothelioma hard stop, right? So what you want to do, though, is not make that diagnosis on something that's not actually fat. So this is an example of a fibrotic pleura that has what we call fake fat. So fake fat looks like fat. You have these open, empty spaces. Uh, it's actually thought to be an artifact to do with processing, um, and in fact, not adipose tissue. And you can see reactive mesothelial cells around fake fat, if especially if you are hanging a diagnosis on uh, invasion into adipose tissue, uh, I would definitely confirm that it is adipose tissue if there's any question. And so doing a quick S100 can really help you. So here's the S100 control in the upper left. You can see it's nicely staining uh, actual adipose tissue. And here's that same case with fake fat. You can see there's not a lick of, of staining going on here. So if you ever had a question, in particular, if you're hanging your diagnosis off of the invasion into that area, just throw an S100 on, S100 on and make sure that what you're looking at is actual fat, okay? And so as I mentioned, I just wanna bring this up again. Regardless of how monotonous or how bland or benign your mesothelial cells look, if they're forming complex architectural patterns or you have invasion into fat or into the lung parenchyma, that is a malignant process. Mesothelial cells should not be invading into the lung parenchyma. That makes them 
that makes it a mesothelioma, all right? So here's an example of mesothelial cells uh, invading into lung tissue. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that this is alveolar parenchyma. You can see these pigmented macrophages. This is clearly a patient who was a smoker. And then you can see mesothelial cells, nice, bland looking, not cytologically atypical in really any way, but they're down in the, in the lung tissue. This is a mesothelioma. And then if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can start to see that it's forming trabecular patterns. Um, so that's also suspicious, but certainly this invasion into the lung clinches your diagnosis. This is a malignant process. Okay, so let's go to case number two. So we have an 82-year-old man with a recurrent right-sided pleural effusion and chest pain. All right, this is a common thing, pleural effusion, chest pain. It's often how they come in. He worked in a shipyard with exposure to asbestos. Cytology specimens from a tap shows atypical appearing mesothelial cells, but not enough that they felt comfortable calling a malignancy. He's had recurrent effusions over a three-month period, all right, and then a pleural biopsy was performed. He also had pleural plaques on imaging, and the clinician was absolutely convinced that this patient had a mesothelioma. He's got the history, you know, everything looks like it. He has the asbestos exposure history. He's got pleural plaques, you know, which are associated with asbestos exposures. They thought this patient had mesothelioma, no question in their minds. Okay, so here's what the biopsy looks like, all right? So we have adipose tissue on the bottom with some chronic inflammation and a markedly thickened fibrotic pleura and what look like kind of very innocuous, bland little spindled cells throughout the pleura. Okay, so what do we want to do with this case? What stains might be helpful? All right, so here's a pankeratin. So remember how I said pankeratin doesn't necessarily tell you if something is a mesothelioma or a carcinoma versus something else, but it does help you with architecture. Okay, so if you look at this pankeratin, you can see that it's staining cells, but they're forming this nice, even zoned line, all right, parallel to this nicely oriented piece of pleura, okay? All right, and then in other areas, you can see these vertically oriented capillaries. Now, of course, things like parallel to the pleura and vertically oriented capillaries depends on having a well-oriented specimen. This, of course, can become much more challenge, challenging when you have twisted pieces of pleura that are embedded. All right, so here's another part. It's kind of wavy looking. Is that enough to be worried about architectural complexity? Nope, this is okay. So if you remember, pleura is of course going to twist and so you can just twist the tissue, but you see how it's still forming this even wave. All right, and they're all nicely parallel. They're not encroaching down. You're not seeing architectural complexity, all right? So this is what a benign process looks like. So this is organizing fibrinous pleuritis negative for malignancy. Okay, so there's nothing here. If this patient does have a mesothelioma, they did not biopsy it in this particular biopsy, okay? All right, so remember, nice ordered even zonation, no invasion into adipose tissue, all right? Parallel orientation to the pleura, vertically oriented capillaries, those are features of benign reactive um, uh, fibrous and fibrinous pleuritis, okay? All right, but the clinician was really sure should you let that asbestos exposure sway your diagnosis? Maybe it's a desmoplastic mesothelioma that you're just having trouble diagnosing. No, the answer is no. So asbestos exposure doesn't turn something into a mesothelioma. The same way that the lack of asbestos exposure doesn't mean the patient doesn't have a mesothelioma. And I have had people argue with me on both sides of this, all right? Based on this biopsy and these findings, there is no evidence of mesothelioma there, okay? So don't let that be swayed. Don't let yourself be swayed by that. Okay. So yes, the patient had pleural plaques, and yes, they had asbestos exposure. But in that biopsy, there wasn't actually any mesothelioma. And the follow-up on that patient is eventually he did uh, clear his effusions uh, after he had the the pleural stripping. So we weren't sure exactly what had caused it, but it wasn't a mesothelioma, and it didn't recur. Okay. So let's go back to our what is the question clearly a malignant lesion versus this may be malignant or it could be reactive, all right? So let's go to the right side of the picture now. So malignant versus reactive. Okay, so my standard pattern for when I'm worried if it's a benign reactive lesion versus say an epithelioid mesothelioma because it's not gonna be versus a sarcomatoid mesothelioma uh, for the most part. Um, primarily it's H&E, to be honest. You can get a really good feel for what you're looking at based off of that architecture. And then stains like pankeratin can help you um, if you're unsure. And that's all. And this is a situation in which you would consider performing a BAP1 or an MTAP immunohistochemistry, okay? So which loss of uh, would be uh, favoring uh, a mesothelioma. 
Okay, so here are a whole bunch of features that help you distinguish benign from malignant benign um, epithelioid or a benign a mesothelial reactive population versus an epithelioid meso. So that ordered zonation, well organized growth, vertical capillaries, necrosis when associated with neutrophils, like you might see in an empyema. Superficial penetration of any mesothelial like tubules you might see, which again, not that common, but occasionally you do see. Cellularity, but it's at the surface of the pleura. You can get some simple non branching papillae or short tufts. Anytime you start to get stuff like that, though, to me, that always raises a red flag, and I would consider and I would do a, a BAP1 and an MTAP. And then actually, cytologic atypia favors a benign mesothelial reactive population. Uh, you know, when you have empyemas and you have uh, infectious processes, you actually get more atypical looking mesothelial cells in contrast to epithelioid mesos, which tend to have more of a cytologic monotony. Okay. And then of course, other fa features that would favor a malignant population that we've shown many examples of now, invasion, disorganized growth, tumefactive growth, any kind of necrosis that's not associated with neutrophils. So bland infarct-like necrosis, infarct -like necrosis, very common in mesos. If you start to see tubules that penetrate deep, um, deep cellularity, and anytime you start to get slightly slight complexity to your papillae and tufts. Okay. So again, we're still in our benign versus malignant question. Loss of BAP1 and or MTAP by IHC or CDKN2A homozygous deletion by FISH. Um, those will support a malignant mesothelioma. MTAP IHC is a surrogate for CDKN2A um, homozygous deletion by FISH. Um, so it's nice if you have both these stains available, you can do both of them. If you have to pick one, I would pick BAP1 personally. I think it's a little bit of a cleaner stain, a little bit easier to look at. So BAP1 loss, you see it in 40 to 60% of pleural mesotheliomas. It tends to be lost more often in epithelioid types compared to sarcomatoid types, which is kind of unfortunate since epithelioid mesos are a little bit easier to diagnose in contrast to sarcomatoid. Um, something to keep in mind though, that BAP1 retention does not mean something is benign. Its loss means that it's almost certainly malignant. All right, deletions of the CDKN2A or P16 gene, you see it in about 70 to 80% of pleural mesos, and um, it's actually seen in quite a bit of pleural sarcomatous uh, mesotheliomas. All right, so uh, here's an example of a mesothelioma, okay, and then here's that BAP1. Okay, so I wanted to show you this particular example of BAP1 because BAP1 is loss, all right? So you're looking for nuclear loss and you always should have a background control of a lymphocyte here or there. This particular case had quite a few lymphocytes which serve as your control, but you can see the nuclei of these, of these mesothelial cells are blue. All right, they're lost, all right? So this is BAP1 loss. So always look a little closer. Now, if you have a giant solid patch of tumor cells and it's all blue, that's easy. But I have seen people call BAP1 retained in cases like this where it actually is lost, okay? Um, so as I mentioned before, and I just want to mention it again because it's really important, BAP1 retention does not mean a process is benign, okay? Um, and BAP1 loss doesn't necessarily mean a malignancy is a mesothelioma, right? So there are other tumors that can show BAP1 loss. So I wouldn't necessarily hang a BAP1 loss on your diagnosis of a mesothelioma versus another tumor like a carcinoma, okay? So if that, so... So I'm going to say that again so it makes sense. So retention of BAP1 doesn't mean a process is benign. Loss of BAP1 supports a mesothelioma but doesn't diagnose a mesothelioma. You can have other tumors that show BAP1 loss. So if you have a tumor that is not behaving, so to speak, with the IHC, it's not staining with mesothelial markers, I would be very cautious about hanging your hat on BAP1 loss, meaning that it's a mesothelioma, okay? And as I mentioned before, you need an internal control. If you have BAP1 loss and nothing is staining, you don't have a single benign cell that has retention of BAP1, that stain did not work, you cannot interpret it, okay? All right, so here's a, an example of a mesothelioma, clearly tumefactive, it's just sheets of cells and BAP1's retained, all right? Does that mean that this is not a mesothelioma? Absolutely not, this was definitely a meso. All right, here's an example of NTAP that's retained. Again, clearly tumefactive, solid sheets of cells. No question, this is a malignant process. So just to show you that they're useful when they're lost, they don't really mean anything if they're retained. Okay, so you might ask, what about mesothelioma in situ? This is something that is currently listed in the WHO. First off, I will say, 
incredibly, incredibly rare. And I'm going to go off of what the WHO says because I have yet to see an isolated case of mesothelioma in situ. I've seen what looks like mesothelioma in situ in a case with invasive mesothelioma, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute, but I've yet to see a case biopsy that's just MIS, so to speak. Uh, but it does apparently exist. So the essential diagnostic criteria based off of the WHO are a non-resolving pleural effusion. Makes sense. Most mesos uh, uh, will present with this. There can't be thoroscopic or imaging evidence of tumor, right? So if the patient has invasive meso and you get something that looks like mesothelioma in situ, likely you just didn't get the invasive meso, right? It has to consist of a single layer of mesothelial cells with or without atypia, on that pleural surface. You can't have any features of invasive growth. You have to see loss of BAP1 and or the MTAP by IHC or the CDKN2A homozygous deletion by fish. And it really needs to be a multidisciplinary discussion to make that diagnosis, okay? And that's the key here. This is actually in the essential diagnostic criteria. I can't think of, I, I don't think I've seen any other place where essential diagnostic criteria requires a multidisciplinary discussion, which should tell you how rare and how careful you need to be about making a diagnosis like this. So here's an example. And again, I'll be fully transparent. This is a faked example because this was an area in a tumor, uh, in a case that had invasive meso elsewhere. But I did find this kind of on the side. Here's a BAP1. So you can see this very innocuous thin layer of mesothelial cells. And here's a BAP1. So you can see you actually have nuclear loss of the BAP1. So this could be argued to be mesothelioma in situ. All right. So back to our question, clearly malignant versus maybe malignant. All right. So let's go back to clearly malignant. Okay. So we talked about epithelioid versus sarcomatoid. So as you can guess, we're going to move to sarcomatoid mesothelioma. Um, so unsurprisingly, sarcomatoid mesotheliomas are going to have spindled cells like you see here. Okay, now there are some additional things we need to support for sarcomatoid mesos. Um, there isn't a grading system, so you don't have to worry about low grade, uh, high grade. Sarcomatoid mesotheliomas are all by nature high grade. They behave quite poorly. There aren't any specific architectural patterns to support, but there are a couple of cytologic features. You can have lymphohistiocytoid features, or you can have transitional features um, or pleomorphic. Okay, so I wanted to point out transitional because um, Transitional features, I think, can be missed. Uh, they often get called epithelioid, but by the time your cells are starting to move into looking sarcomatoid and become transitional, they're going to behave like a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. So don't give someone an epithelioid mesothelioma when, in fact, they have transitional features and they're really going to behave like a sarcomatoid. Stromal features, desmoplastic, and heterologous differentiation. So this becomes quite important in sarcomatoid mesos, uh, especially desmoplastic, which can be quite challenging to diagnose. Okay. So key points for sarcomatoid malignancies in the thorax. Unfortunately, the immunophenotype of these tumors, whether they're sarcomatoid carcinomas or sarcomatoid mesotheliomas, or even rarer, just a sarcoma, um, the immunophenotype is often indistinct, which is unfortunate because they can be quite challenging. And to remember that statistically, sarcomatoid carcinomas are much more common than sarcomatoid mesotheliomas. So if you have a patient that comes with a large, right middle lobe lung mass and they resect it and it has this weird overlapping phenotype and some calretinin staining, but some TTF1 staining and I don't know, a little of this, a little of that, it's likely going to be a sarcomatoid carcinoma, not a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. So with these caveats in mind, I want to point out uh, some of the staining patterns in sarcomatoid carcinomas versus mesotheliomas. So you can see keratins, again, don't help you. Um, they only might be useful if you're trying to confirm invasion or a complex architectural pattern. Calretinin, uh, it can be positive in both. So again, Calretin positivity doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mesothelioma. It can support it. D240, again, a little bit less in carcinoma, but still only 35% of mesos will stain. And you can see it's very similar in many of the other stains as well. One stain that can be quite useful that I want to point out uh, is uh, GATA3. So GATA3 uh, this this uh, chart here from 2003 and 2014 lists 100% of sarcomatoid meso staining with GATA3. Uh, as the literature has gone over time, that is actually not true. And I will tell you anecdotally, that is not true. But if you get strong staining with GATA3, uh, that can be really helpful for sarcomatoid meso, especially in the right radiologic context. Pleural thickening, no primary lung mass, um, you know, recurrent unilateral pleural effusions, all of those things. Um, 
I do want to point out, though, that you can also get GATA3 staining in sarcomatoid carcinomas, okay? And if you want to see it in mesos, the stronger and more diffuse it is, the better it supports a sarcomatoid meso. All right, stains that are typically not useful, CEA, CD15, Mach 31, they're not really going to help you in these cases. Okay, so here's an example of my standard pattern for sarcomatoid malignancies in the thorax. The epithelial markers stay the same, TTF1, Claudin 4, polyclonal CEA, pancaritin for architecture, but not necessarily to tell you the type of tumor, GATA3. You can do the other mesothelial markers, WT1, D240, calretinin. Uh, some folks will say, no, I'm not going to do those markers because there's so much overlap, and I think that's very reasonable. I find if I get a strong block staining for all of the mesothelial markers, that will help support uh, sarcomatoid meso. Um, but again, it's why we have the panels, because there's so much overlap, you have to be careful. Uh, and if you have epithelial markers, such as TTF1 and Claudin4 staining, call that a sarcomatoid carcinoma, even if you have some of these patchy mesothelial markers. Um, it is much more rare to see a sarcomatoid meso with TTF1 staining than it is to see a sarcomatoid carcinoma with meso staining. Okay? So sometimes you're just playing the odds. And of course, correlate with radiology. So here's an example of a sarcomatoid meso showing you that nice tumefactive growth pattern. Okay, so you can see this hypercellular area uh, in the center. All right, this is a tumefactive pattern. This is not a reactive process. What you see on the bottom looks like it could be reactive, but not what's on the top here. Okay, so here's high power, kind of bland-ish looking uh, uh, spindled cells with some admixed uh, lymphocytes, so stains uh, and history. Okay, here's another example. This is an, a nice, nicely showing a hypercellular nodule with a little bit of hypocellularity around it. But again, complex architecture, right? It looks like this is a swirling piece in the center, and then it's juxtaposed with these cells going uh, oriented the other direction. So that complex, non-linear, non-zonated cells, that tells you what you're looking at as a malignant process. All right. Here's another example that actually had some entrapped lung in it. Okay. So actually, this is lung invasion. And so this is uh, certainly helping you confirm that these almost very bland, possibly reactive looking spindled cells are in fact invading into the lung. Okay, so here's fat invasion. All right, this also has a few little kind of desmoplastic features, a little of the hyalinized pink look you see with uh, desmoplastic sarcomatoid meso. And you might wonder, are there tumor cells in here? So this is where stains can help you. So here's a pancytokeratin and just look at all those tumor cells. And I'll go back to that other one. Pretty, pretty innocuous. You might easily miss them. Um, but your pancaritin shows you diffuse invasion into adipose tissue. No question, this is malignant now. Okay. Um, so here's a needle core. So what are the features of malignancy we see in this needle core? All right. So you've got necrosis here where the stars are, the asterisks are, all right, bland infarct-like necrosis. You're not seeing neutrophils, okay? And then it's tumefactive, right? So this whole core is just consisting of these spindled cells, all right? So tumefactive growth, necrosis, do your stains, and hopefully they'll support it and compare with your radiology, and you can call a mesothelioma. Here's an example of a calretinin in a sarcomatoid. This one has some transitional features, has a little bit more rounded, roundedness to some of these cells, but still a sarcomatoid meso. You can see the staining is really patchy, which is often the case with these, uh, with these tumors. All right, here's a GATA3, nice, strong, diffuse nuclear positivity. That would support more of a sarcomatoid meso. All right, so I wanted to take a minute to talk about desmoplastic mesothelioma. We've touched on it a little bit before, but I think this can be a particular challenge in an already challenging area of, uh, of tumors. And it's because the spindled cells are often very bland, very small. You often have hypocellular areas. And so if you biopsy those hypocellular areas, you might not have diagnostic features. Um, so things that can help you are that tumor necrosis, and it's often that bland infarct-like necrosis like we saw uh, on this core right here, okay? Abrupt changes in cellularity like we've been talking about. So if all of a sudden you have lots of spindled cells, even if they look bland, and it's immediately juxtaposed next to an area that shows you nothing, just collagen fibrosis, that's a bad sign. And then, of course, invasion into fat or the underlying lung parenchyma tells you what you're looking at as a malignant process. And very important is a haphazard growth pattern. And this is often your first clue when you're looking at small biopsies, okay? So here's an example showing you a combination of a different feature. So you see the black arrow is pointing to hypercellularity, okay? 
And then you can see this is more hypocellular and you have this you have this hyalinized look, all right? This is that 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 desmoplastic look. And it looks like like almost like a whirlpool, right? So if like if you were looking at multiple whirlpool eddies a, a, across like a pond or the ocean or something, it looks kind of like that. That's your one of oftentimes your first clue that what you're looking at is a desmoplastic meso. It's not the cytologic atypia of the cells, all right? If you look a bit higher power in that same case, the cells are so small and so inconspicuous, but they look irregular. OK, the architecture is irregular and you have this hyalinized look. OK, and then if you look at pancytokeratin, it highlights all of those cells, right? These aren't fibroblasts. All right. These are these are mesothelioma cells. So this is a nice classic example of what a desmoplastic meso would look like. But you can tell how you could easily go down the route of thinking, oh, it's just some reactive fibrous changes. You know, let it go. Don't let it go. Look for that architectural atypia. OK. All right, and here's a little even higher power showing you how bland uh, these cells look. Okay, so here's a needle core biopsy, um, example of a desmoplastic meso. Again, you have this area of kind of hypercellularity and disorganized growth pattern. And there's what it looks like on the pancytic keratin. It's not forming that, that smooth line that we saw on that reactive case earlier. Here's an example of bland infarct-like necrosis. It's very subtle. You might even miss it if you weren't looking careful enough. If you it, carefully enough, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, you can see there are cells here, small, inconspicuous, spindled cells, and then on the right side, it's just pure pink. So this is that infarct-like necrosis. All right, here's another example. This is a little easier to see. Okay, again, tumor necrosis. You're not seeing lots of neutrophils. You're not seeing, you know, evidence of an empyema. Not to say you can't have a mesothelioma and an empyema at the same time. I have seen that. Really complicated. But still, you know, look at it in the overall picture. All right, so here's a hypercellular tumefactive nodule. Really well appreciated on uh, keratin here. So you can see the keratin. You can see the areas of hypocellularity on the right and then hypercellularity on the left. And you can imagine if you get a needle core through this right uh, area of this, if the pleural biopsy, it might be impossible to make a diagnosis of a desmoplastic meso. Uh, you can hopefully raise the possibility, uh, but they might need to just go back and get more tissue. Okay, so our last type is a biphasic mesothelioma. So in order to diagnose a biphasic meso, you have to have greater than or equal to 10% of each component in a resection specimen. So a small biopsy, you can't really diagnose it, but you can raise the possibility, say, oh, it looks like a biphasic meso, okay? And your percentage of each should be reported uh, in the resection specimens. I also report them in my small biopsies as well. All right, so here's an example. So you can see there's some uh, necrosis. I just wanna point that out there with the asterisk there in the bottom. And you can see areas of more epithelioid cells with the black arrows with this admixed spindled hyalinized desmoplastic look in the background. So this is a nice example of a biphasic mesothelioma. Okay, here's another example. You can see the epithelioid portion on the left. I would say this is probably a high nuclear grade. You can even see a number of mitotic figures. So there's a mitos mitosis, there's a mitosis here. There's one, maybe that's a pycnotic figure there, but multiple mitotic figures in less than one high power field. So, uh, and tumor necrosis. So it's definitely, if you were grading it, that would be a high grade epithelioid meso, but we don't grade in biphasics. And then you have the spindle cells on the right. Okay, um, so again, don't miss the spindled cell portion. Uh, don't miss a biphasic meso. So um, because sometimes I think the, the spindled cells, they, they look a little innocuous and you, you may think of them as just reactive. Um, but do your stains when in doubt uh, to show that they are in fact tumor cells. All right. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about some of the clinical presentations of mesothelioma. So we've talked about some of the more obvious ones. Patients can come in with recurrent pleural effusions and chest pain. You can, they can show up as metastatic disease, like in the lymph node or in the bone, does happen. They could be more of a localized mass, which could potentially be resectable. Sometimes they start in the pleura and then eat into the lung. And so that that might be challenging from a radiologic perspective to decide, is this a lung cancer that moved into the pleura or is this a pleural-based disease that moved into the lung? And then you hope you get an epithelioid meso so the stains uh, cooperate. Um, and then they can be intrapulmonary occasionally, very rare, but it does happen. They can also come in, this can also be a etiology of pneumothorax, okay? So this is the one where oftentimes people are surprised by it. The patient has a spontaneous pneumothorax and they think, okay, we don't know what's going on. And it turns out there is a evolving mesothelioma underlying it that they didn't, that they couldn't uh, really uh, appreciate on the imaging. Okay, so now I want to show you a few terrifying uh, presentations and uh, I wanted to thank my colleague, Dr. Brandon Larson, who supplied the next couple of photos. 
There are patterns of mesos that can mimic non-neoplastic disease. It can be pneumoconiosis-like. It can look like DIP or disquamative interstitial pneumonia, which is when you have lots of macrophages in a smoker filling alveolar spaces. They can be organizing pneumonia-like, spindled cells looking like OP. They can also be Langerhans cell histiocytosis-like. And then patterns that can mimic other neoplasms, uh, such as adenocarcinoma. They can grow in a lipidic, acinar, micropapillary, and solid patterns, just like adenocarcinoma can. So here's a pneumoconiosis-like pattern. On low power, you might think that this looks like silicosis, right? You have these hyalinized whirling nodules with a lot of what look like histiocytes around them. Uh, in fact, this was a mesothelioma. So here's a WT1 showing you uh, staining, nice strong nuclear staining. Here's an example of a DIP-like uh, pattern. Again, a quick uh, look. These these could be macrophages, right, on low power. Macrophages filling filling the alveolar spaces, especially if the patient comes with a diagnosis uh, as being a smoker and the and the disease is quite diffuse. Uh, but again, there's a WT1 showing you strong nuclear staining, uh, definitely not macrophages, and this was a mesothelioma. Thankfully, these rare cases I'm showing you are just that, rare. But still, it's a good reminder uh, to always keep a mesothelioma in the back of your mind. Here's an organizing pneumonia-like pattern. Sure looks like plugs uh, filling alveolar spaces, but on closer examination, the cells in those plugs are a little bit bigger than what you would expect from uh, simple uh, fibroblasts. And again, that WT1 shows you, well, there's WT1 positive cells in the lung parenchyma. Certainly, you should not see that. And here are examples of lipidic growth, acinar growth, solid growth, and micropapillary growth of mesothelioma, all perfectly mimicking what you might see in an adenocarcinoma. Uh, so cases like this, especially the lipidic growth, remind me of why it's important to open the chart, look at the imaging, and think about these cases, especially uh, with that patient history, okay? All right, so review points. Know your question. No, are you thinking, is this a benign tumor versus a malignant tumor? And then you go down the reactive mesothelial cell population versus mesothelioma. Uh, or if you're looking at a definitively malignant process, a carcinoma versus a mesothelioma. Uh, remember, uh, staining is the name of the game for epithelioid mesos. And that sarcomatoid mesotheliomas often have an indistinct immunoprofile. You may be left with something that just has a little bit of keratin staining and nothing else. But in the appropriate clinical context, you can favor a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. But remember that sarcomatoid carcinomas are statistically more common. So again, look at that radiology. Do they have a lung mass? Uh, don't discount just basic H&E. Histologic features can be vital in making a diagnosis. I will say that for most of my epithelioid mesos, I know it's going to be a mesothelioma before I see my stains. Um, but we have to do our stains to prove it, since remember, many of these cases uh, often end up in the courtroom. Uh, mesothelioma is a great mimicker uh, and to correlate uh, with your imaging. All right, so I thank you for your attention and uh, going through this whirlwind review of mesothelioma with me. And I am uh, happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Butt, for this excellent review on mesotheliomas. Uh, if you don't mind, can you please turn your video on? Yes, absolutely. Thank you Hello. so much. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few questions online that I can see. And uh, one question, uh, I would like to read it to you first. Uh, for diffuse mesothelioma cases where they do pleural dripping and where there is involvement of pericardium, how do you give margin status on CAP protocol? All right. Um, so that's a great question. <laughs> Uh, and it can be challenging. So I, I think with the with the pleural strippings and concern about involvement of the pericardium, the key is one, uh, working with your surgeon, right? So if they strip something off and they call it pericardium and they put it in a separate jar and tell you this is pericardium and you see mesothelioma, that can help you with your staging. Um, sometimes what happens though is you get everything all together and you can't necessarily differentiate which piece of fibrous looking tissue is the pericardium. And so I would say uh, having having a good relationship with your surgeons about these cases so that they make sure to put those specimens in separate jars is your key to staging these, these, these patients correctly. Um, and so for my approach, uh, yeah, again, Thankfully, I'm, I'm grateful for my surgeons here. Uh, they uh, are very good about putting things in separate jars. And if I can't tell 
you know, if it's, if they've, if everything's together and they say, oh, we think we got a bit of the pericardium. If I can't tell, I don't go out on a limb. Um, I'm just straightforward with, hey, you know, there's meso there's widespread mesothelioma. The pericardium is not immediately identifiable, cannot rule out, and you have to correlate with uh, surgical findings, uh, to be honest. That's how I deal with those cases. Okay. Um, okay, so, so the first questions, I'm just going to go down the list here. Uh, what other tumors can have a BAP1 loss? So there's a couple other tumors. There's uh, some, I think, Spitz tumors. Uh, there's a few renal cell carcinomas. Uh, melanoma can have BAP1 loss. And I'm sure as we go forward, we'll find more and more tumors that show BAP1 loss. So so I think that's a it's, it's key to know that the BAP1 loss doesn't necessarily turn a malignant process into a meso versus another malignant process, but it does support it. Okay, so the next question is, can adenomatoid tumors, benign proliferation of mesothelial cells occur in the pleura, similar to paratesticular region, or are they called mesothelioma in the pleura? Ooh, that is a wonderful question. Um, the adenomatoid pattern is so exceedingly rare. I'm not sure there's data to support this one way or another. Uh, I would say, at least from my anecdotal experience, if I see something growing in a tumefactive fashion and has adenomatoid architecture, I'm going to call that a mesothelioma. Um, but it's such a rare pattern to see. I don't think we have the data to say whether or not it could be a benign proliferation. All right. Uh, next question is, is the MOVAT stain helpful to assess evasion, invasion into the lung parenchyma? Yeah, sure. So I think um, you can use a MOVAT stain. You could use just a basic elastic stain if you don't have MOVAT. Another thing um, sometimes that I'll do is I will do a TTF1 and a calretinin, and then I'll compare them because you can see if you see TTF1 positive cells right next to a calretinin positive cell, you know that pneumocytes are hobnobbing, hobnobbing uh, with a mesothelioma cell. Um, so there's any number of ways you can assess for invasion, but certainly a MOVAT could potentially help. Um, but I actually find the TTF and calretinin uh, will be useful there. All right, mesothelioma in cytology, uh, what's the general approach? Great question. So I think there's been a lot of a lot of back and forth in the literature about whether or not you can diagnose a mesothelioma in cytology. And certainly it's a topic that I've discussed with my cytopathology uh, colleagues and friends uh, quite often. I would say if there is a strong clinical concern for a mesothelioma uh, in cytology and you don't have complex architectural pieces, right? So if you only have single cells, so, all right, so let me back up. So if you have, in cytology, if you have single cells, all right, you don't have any complex architecture, uh, because sometimes in cytology, you'll get pieces of complex architecture, you know, complex little papillary tuft or a solid chunk of cells. If you just have single cells, I would say do a BAP1 and MTAP. Um, and if it's lost, I would say that that is highly suspicious for mesothelioma. Um, there are some that would outright call it, and I, I have outright called it if I have that in conjunction with a piece or two of complex architecture. I still hesitate to, out, to call it just on BAP1 loss only. That said, there really isn't any literature to show that benign mesothelial cell populations have BAP1 um, loss. So that's a future project. Hopefully we can publish that at some point. Um, but I would say err on the side of caution. If you only have single cells with BAP1 loss, say highly suspicious uh, for malignant mesothelioma. Don't let that patient disappear uh, into the world. Get get a, a tissue biopsy to confirm it. If I do have some complex architecture on a cell block, for example, uh, I will call it mm. on cytology uh, without question. And I have many times in the past. Okay. Um, do you use glute in your workup? So I don't use glute in my workup. Um, mm. I, I think it's a, a reasonable marker. There's, there's, I feel like every six months, there's another paper that comes out about a mesothelioma marker. And I will say that they're all reasonable. And the reality is there's yet to be a marker that is the smoking gun, so to speak, that is the final word, that this is the mesothelioma marker. Um, so honestly, use a panel of a couple of stains. If you like glute um, and you want to use it in, in, in your workup, that's fine. You still have to use a panel of a couple of stains of epithelial markers and mesothelial markers and go from there. Okay, so what about, other question, what about the mimickers of sarcomatoid mesothelioma, such as solitary fibrous tumor and other, and can you give an example and if it's necessary to use IHC? Yes, so a solitary fibrous tumor can definitely mimic a sarcomatoid mesothelioma. Um, SFTs tend to be more discrete lesions, and so um, I don't 
standard do a stat six as part of my workup, but I have certainly done it on cases. Uh, I don't think it would be unreasonable to put that as part of your standard panel for a spindle cell lesion in the lung, especially if it's pleural based. Um, I usually end up doing it in many cases. The reality is, is oftentimes though with sarcomatoid mesos, they're so overtly malignant. Um, and I'm able to get my answer from my first round of stains. If I end up going to a second round of stains and I'm worried that, gosh, could this be an unusual, you know, malignant SFT, then I certainly would add a STAT-6. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, I do do IHC on sarcomatoid mesos. I know that there is a lot of overlap, but I always will do IHC on a sarcomatoid lesion because more likely than mesos, they end up being a sarcomatoid carcinoma. Um, and so I always will do a, at least a small panel on sarcomatoid um, uh, cases in, in, the, in the thorax, even knowing that there might be immunophenotypic overlap. Next question, uh, why are there no architectural patterns in sarcomatoid mesothelioma? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's just, it's sarcomatoid. Uh, and so that's its only pattern is it's sarcomatoid. Um, I don't think they they decided that there was any value in the prognosis to break them down um, just because they're all going to have a bad pattern versus in the epitheliod uh, mesotheliomas, um, there's actually prognostic differentiation among some of the patterns versus there's not in sarcomatoid. It's just all bad. So that would be why I think they don't have uh, particular patterns that they want you uh, to, to mention in your reports. Okay, next question is, do you ever perform P53 in a mesothelioma diagnosis? Um, usually I don't perform P53. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't used it, to be honest. I have seen people that, that have used it, but I haven't found it to be particularly helpful. And again, there's, there's so many different stains um, that you can do for mesos, and there's yet to be the perfect ones. So it's always going to be a panel. Okay, so what is your suggested panel to differentiate adenocarcinoma and mesothelioma when limited immunostains are available? So I would say if we're talking about numbers of stains, you only need four. You have to do two of each. So I would do a TTF1 and a Claudin, um, and then I would do a calretinin and a WT1 if I could only do the absolute limited panel. If it's a concern about types of stains being available, I know not all labs have Claudin 4. It's a little bit earlier. Um, I would use either a Mach 31 or a Berry P4 together with a TTF1, and then uh, calretinin and whatever other immunostain you might have available. Um, but the bare minimum is, is two stains on each side. And then if it was a sarcomatoid, uh, I would do a TTF1 and a GATA3. Those would be my bare, bare minimum um, if you had limited options. All right, so do you have cases in which you change the diagnosis from biphasic mesothelioma in a small biopsy to a monophasic type when a resection is submitted? That is a wonderful question. It has not come up for me personally, but I can see how it might. Uh, but I still think there's value in mentioning that other component, especially if that other component is a sarcomatoid. I will say anecdotally, since sarcomatoid tends to behave in a worse fashion and tends to be more aggressive, usually it ends up being that you might see an epithelioid component on a resection, like a very minor component of epithelioid that you didn't see on the biopsy. And interestingly enough, I will say that the epithelioid component is often what helps you make the diagnosis of a sarcomatoid component. I've had cases where most of the biopsy, even generous, uh, most of the biopsy uh, is sarcomatoid and none of the stains are cooperating, but there's a small component of epithelioid that stains perfectly, calretinin, WT1, D240, and having those side by side can tell you, oh, this is a mesothelioma and it's just most of it's sarcomatoid. All right. I think I've answered all the questions that are up here so far. I think you answered the question on P53. I did. I don't use it. Right, and there is again another question on uh, what is your experience on benign adenomatous tumors in the pleura? I think you answered. I that answered that one first. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. right. yeah, yeah. I have uh, yet to see one. I think it's just such a rare. It's a, such a rare finding. <laughs> right, uh, and there's another question about subtyping of mesothelioma on small biopsy samples. So, do you have any advice on that? Yeah, so I always mention the components that I see in the small biopsy, um, especially if one is more prevalent than the other, because I do think that has prognostic value. Um, 
And so, I, so I'll, I'll always mention what components I see. So if I see both sarcomatoid and epithelioid, I will mention that. And while we're not technically required to give a percentage on a biopsy, I still give it. Um, I think it's potentially valuable data uh, for the for the clinicians to know, is this, they did a biopsy and it's 95% sarcomatoid versus they did a biopsy and it's 95% epithelioid. So I do mention that on small biopsies. And then of course, um, it's a requirement to mention it on uh, larger resections. Right. And uh, there is a question about uh, how do you interpret BAP1 on cell block? Yeah. So as I mentioned, so for BAP1 on the cell block, if it's lost and I don't have, like, if I don't have complex architecture, only single cells, I will say highly suspicious for involvement by malignant mesothelioma. If I do have complex architecture, which you often do see chunks of uh, in uh, cell blocks, then I'll call it a malignant mesothelioma, especially with the BAP1 loss. So it really just depends on what you're seeing. I do think going forward, we may reach a point where we can call it on individual cells uh, only without complex architecture, um, but I, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we still need to see a bit more data on BAP1. Right, thank you. Uh, there's a question about uh, fish, that how often do you send uh, samples for fish? Okay, great question. I actually usually don't send for fish. I find that uh, the BAP1 and the MTAP are sufficient uh, in conjunction with my other uh, IHC. And, you know, fish always takes a little bit longer and it's a little bit more expensive. So it's it's not my standard to send for fish, but certainly you can if that's if you have it available and it's easy to use, um, it's it's certainly good. But I find that the IHC is is for most cases more than sufficient. Only rarely do I ever send for fish. Right. I think I think you answered this question earlier that uh, on cytology, uh, many people uh, avoid calling mesothelioma on uh, cytology. And what is your yes. approach about that? Probably you answered yes. that. Right? Yeah. And I think, too, if, if you're in doubt, don't call it. Don't overreach yourself because it's hard to take that label of mesothelioma back. Um, you know, and if, if you need to send it out, send it out. Uh, a lot of mesotheliomas end up going to consult uh, just because of the litigious concerns. But again, if you see complex architecture on your cell block together with BAP1 loss, I feel comfortable calling it. Uh, if you only have individual cells, and you have BAP1 loss, uh, typically I will just say highly suspicious for mesothelioma. I have yet to see a case of a reactive mesothelial population that showed BAP1 loss, anecdotally speaking. All right, and the next question was role of cytopathology in meso. Just answered that. Yeah. I think that's a big question that comes up a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think many uh, viewers had that question in different forms for you. Mm -hmm. So, uh... I think these are all the questions that I could see online again. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Bud, for this excellent talk. And you have answered uh, so many questions from our viewers, and we really appreciate your effort. And before we conclude, I would like to just let you know that we had lots of viewers who joined online, over 100. And I could keep track of viewers who joined from Ireland, Saudi Arabia, Zimbabwe, Turkey, India, Pakistan, Spain, United Kingdom. Uh, of course, uh, viewers from United States also joined in. And for our viewers, thanks for your support. And if you like our lectures, so don't forget to follow our uh, YouTube channel that is Pathcast. And we have a website that is pathologycast.com. And also like we have a, uh, what is that called? A Twitter account or now you call it X. So please don't forget to follow us there. And our next lecture is on blood bank. And our speaker is going to be Dr. Matthew Elkins, who is director of transfusions and medicine in sunny upstate medical university in New York. And he's going, he's going to talk about transfusion reactions overview. And that's on September 11th, that's next Monday and same time. So hope to see you all at that time. And thank you again. And thank you so much, Dr. Bhatt. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you.